Hi, and welcome to the ONF Spotlight on 5G. I'm Timon Sloan with the ONF, and today it's my pleasure to welcome Chris DePuy, technology analyst and founder of 650 Group. Chris covers the telecom industry and much more, and interesting fact, Chris was co-author of the original The Internet Report in 1995 at Morgan Stanley that launched coverage of the internet and uh, the transformation that took place from there. With that background, it's really interesting to have Chris now looking at the transformation taking place with open source and openness in the telecom industry. And with that, uh, Chris, I'm really pleased to have you here with us today, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. So Chris, please Thanks. take it away. Thank you, Timon. Thanks for having me. Uh, so um, I'd like to turn everyone's attention to the slide, uh, slides here that I have on the screen, and I'd like to discuss the, uh, the impact of open source on on communication service provider networks and with a particular focus on wireless capital spending. So here we go. Um, I just want to start out first with just what is um, what's going on. We, we looked at the addressable market um, for uh, what um, ONF calls CORD, um, which probably most of the people in the audience are aware of. This is central office re-architected as a data center, and it encompasses many different technology areas. And just for background, what we uh, are doing this year is sort of like a follow-up to a presentation that I made uh, last year at, um, at a, about the same conference a year ago. And um, we, at the time, presented some survey findings, and uh, this year we updated them. So this is kind of like a revisiting of what changed over the past year as it relates to cord and in particular the, the wire, wireless industry. So here we go. So let's talk about the addressable market. Um, for those of you who did attend uh, the presentation or saw it, we uh, were explaining that cord related equipment software uh, spending, capital spending over the next five years would be 490 billion. Uh, that was last year's number. This year we reassess the market and uh, we now have come up with the five-year revenues uh, for capital spending of just a notch under 500 billion so half a trillion dollars this is an enormous uh, opportunity uh, for for spending and it encompasses many different technology areas in service provider capital spending so one of the things that has really struck me uh, here is that the the Areas that were focused on first um, by ONF, um, as well as um, others who are trying to uh, promote openness in the service provider market, um, these were things like broadband access and uh, telecom core, in this particular case involved packet core, as well as routing. And that's where you saw the first uh, areas of focus. The big uh, part of the pie chart, though, is radio access networks. This has been, the, in some ways, the holy grail for, um, for focusing on uh, new uh, business models and new ways of building out networks. And what, uh, what we found is that this is actually happening. Um, we, we've had several trends that are uh, underway or, or soon to be underway that are, that are kicking in to the RAN market. And it is just such a big part of spending that um, it really will make a, a sizable difference in, um, in, in terms of the addressable market. So. Uh, that is, um, that's the summary on what we have here for the addressable market. And the key is, is also that the radio access network, network market is incredibly complex and there's lots of dollars to it. So let's dive into some more details. I want to shift gears a little bit and just talk about what we've seen in Telecom Core because uh, in many ways, we're running the same type of, um, let's say, experiment or the same type of trajectory in radio access networks. So in Telecom Core, what we saw was a transition from physical network devices, proprietary boxes with software embedded in them. And uh, we're seeing now that these functions are being built now as software and they're running, for the most part, on servers. You can see that in the year 2020 this year, where roughly half of the revenues uh, are virtual and the other half are physical. And, um, you know, I've made a silly little catchphrase, mission accomplished. Um, the idea is that we are almost to the point where in a couple of years, we're going to say just about every project that is sold into the telecom network will be virtual. And this is a big, big accomplishment 
and um, you know has has had many many benefits uh, along the way, and it took a while, uh, and that's sort of the point here. If um, if you remember how we we got started, this began with the uh, Etsy Mano white paper back in um, uh, 2013, if my memory serves me right, and it really took a couple of years uh, later after that was written. 2015 is when we had the very first virtual revenues. Now we're at half, and so on. So this is just a, a point of reference to consider when we're talking about other telecom markets. It takes a while, and there's a lot of dollars associated with it, and it, it can be done. So let's now carry the analogy forward. So uh, you can see on the bottom of this time scale, this is what we were just talking about, the, the white paper, NFVs ramping up, NFVs at 50% uh, this year, and then in a handful of years, we're gonna see NFVs about 90% percent of sales. That's what the chart before it showed. Now, um, I'd say last year, um, going into this year, is when Open ran, uh, let's just say ramped up. That's kind of where we were with the, with the uh, NFE movement um, maybe, maybe a handful of years ago. And uh, it's our expectation in our forecasts that Open ran will become mainstream in a handful of years. That's what this chart's showing. It's um, running sort of like as a phase shift of what we saw with uh, the NFV movement. Um, simultaneously, uh, if you look at the top of this chart, uh, the ONF came up with, um, it introduced CORD, which we talked about earlier, and um, uh, is now um, introducing open source RAN. What our expectation is, is that um, the open source RAN movement will sort of uh, run on the coattails, let's say, of open RAN. Open source RAN will follow open RAN. And I realize these sound similar, but they're actually uh, quite different and have different uh, characteristics with them. But the thing is, um, you know, this is a very large complex market, the radio access network market, and we actually have um, done some of the ice breaking with open RAN. Um, I'll just add uh, this point here, which is somewhat parenthetical to um, the idea of, of um, open source use of, of radio access networks, but, but it is important, and that is because what's happening is we are seeing uh, unlicensed and shared spectrum enter the lexicon of service provider uh, radio access networks. In other words, it is now possible for enterprises and other organizations that are not telecom operators to build their own cellular networks. This is a very, very big idea, and it is available um, this year. In fact, in the US, the CBRS spectrum uh, became commercially available, or at least the first half GAA, and now we're seeing uh, other auctions, like the PAL auction kind of come to its completion uh, this, this and next month. So uh, that, as I'm saying in the slides here, is sort of uncorking a big uh, opportunity and it is not just the CBRS spectrum. Uh, we're also um, experiencing you know, the opening up of the six gigahertz spectrum in the US and in some European nations, as well as in Latin America. And um, you know, we're, seeing, we're seeing plenty of um, fanfare around, around this new uh, six gigahertz spectrum. It's a very big deal and can, again, present a new way of opening up the radio access network market, primarily because we're gonna see a new uh, set of vendors and uh, techniques to be employed uh, on unlicensed spectrum, which can cross fertilize into the service provider market or could theoretically. But anyway, it's a it's a pretty interesting uh, shift in the marketplace, and I do I do expect that this will that unlicensed will um, create changes in the architecture for radio access networks. Okay, um, as I said, we ran a survey last year um, at this time for the ONF conference. And uh, then this year we updated the results. In other words, we ran the survey again with similar questions uh, across a similar audience. And what, I, what I've um, put on the slide here is on the left, uh, the pie chart is the 2019 results for what is your top ranked open source project. And on the right, you can see our 2020 results for the same question, top rank open source project. And well, if you look at the two charts, what you see is that uh, initially, uh, or last year, let's say broadband access represented um, the majority of the projects were ranked first. 
uh, followed by mobile core, optical transport, and then mobile RAN. And this year, what we're seeing is a much more even response. In other words, uh, the uh, large uh, market of mobile RAN is now becoming um, you know, more prevalent. And we're seeing that uh, core and optical transport are also uh, topped rank. So what this means, uh, at least it means to me, is we are seeing uh, more than just a broadband access uh, push here. It's becoming more widespread across different technology areas. And if you remember what uh, I was shown in the total adjustable market slide earlier, what we, what we are talking about is a dramatic expansion in terms of uh, the use of open source uh, techniques across very large dollar amounts. So now in the 2020 results, what you see is uh, more participation uh, by service providers in very large dollar areas. So this is a very encouraging sign. And we were, um, what we're seeing is a, a pretty big shift in, in uh, the use of open source um, by telecom operators. Okay, um, we also updated some other uh, questions that relate to capital spending trends. And on the left, you can see for 2019, the question was, one of the questions was, what percent of your CapEx budget is focused on open source projects for your top ranks projects? And um, last, uh, last year was 10 to 15%. You can see now that the range of answers is um, becoming uh, wider and uh, bigger in some cases and smaller in others. And then again, what was the percent of total CapEx budget focused on open source? You can see uh, that the, the answers have become wider. And you know, there's many reasons this may uh, be the case, but what we're, what we're pretty sure of is that the, uh, you know, by adding these other technology areas that I was talking about in the previous chart, it creates more, more uncertainty because it wasn't just, say, focused on broadband. We now have new technology areas to focus on. And um, again, you can see uh, the last question, CapEx project um, focused on open source in the next few years. We're seeing uh, in some cases that uh, operators are actually expecting uh, benefits from employing open source here in that they are um, talking about negative CapEx numbers over the next couple of years. And um, in, our, uh, in our way of thinking that is that what this means is that um, operators are expecting savings from employing open source uh, techniques. So that's, um, that's our, at least our interpretation of this data. You're, you're, willing, you're more than willing to, you know, you can go and make your own interpretations, but anyway, those are ours. And the other um, thing that we asked operators uh, a year ago, and then this year is, uh, when do you think op open source will be uh, uh, mass adopted in your network? And what we're, what we're uh, seeing is that you know, by 2025, uh, all operators who at least responded to the survey expect uh, open source to see mass adoption. It's a really big deal if you think about it. There's a very big shift in the way operators uh, we'll build their networks and, um, you know, the trajectory is up and to the right, let's say, because last year uh, we were talking about 85%, now we're talking about 100%. So um, we are, you know, using survey results to connect the dots, but what we're, what we're seeing is a very encouraging sign of an expansion in the expectation that open source will be employed, as well as uh, an increase in the number of projects that are employing these techniques. Okay, um, we did not last year ask RAN specific questions. This year we did. So I wish I could show you 2019 <laughs> numbers, but we don't have them. Um, uh, but this year we do. So let's talk about Open RAN. Remember, remember, Open RAN is a specification that defines the way that one part of the RAN network will connect to another. And um, in theory, it allows you to have multi-vendor networks. We are seeing some multi-vendor networks. Um, a good example is with the Rakuten network in Japan, where radios from one vendor are being connected to baseband systems on servers from another. So in some ways, you could say we've already seen multi-vendor uh, open RAN networks. But the point of it is, is we asked, uh, when will will you procure open RAN interface products? And um, it was a pretty even response across time. Some vendors are um, procuring this year using this, this technique. 
Uh, and then over the next handful of years, we are um, seeing responses that uh, this will occur over the next three years. And then there are some others who just say, we're not going to do it. Okay. So, um, but uh, you get the idea. It's a pretty even, even spread across 2020 to 2023. Um, this, this does uh, coincide with our other research. We, we do expect Open RAN to ramp at a, uh, at a reasonably um, good pace over the next couple of years. And, and like I said, these results are uh, matching what, um, what we've been researching. Okay, so that's the open RAN interface question. Now, uh, we also asked, when will you require open source RAN? Again, this is different. This means using open source software uh, on RAN systems, okay? Um, so they are, they sound, the terminology sound very similar, but these are quite different um, questions. So uh, we, we got the response of from 2022 to 2024, we will begin requiring open source RAN, and then, of course, a larger um, answer of not in the foreseeable future. And so, what this um, looks like is uh, we're we're seeing open RAN uh, be adopted earlier, followed by open source RAN. You know, as a phase shift next. So again, bear in mind that uh, we're just seeing the ONF uh, in, introduce uh, open source now. So it'd be you know. Would take a little while for, for operators to, um, you know, start to start using it, and that's what these survey results are confirming. Now, um, one of the things we've seen in the radio access network market is um, a change in the competitive landscape. So, if you were from left to right, the two G era, let's just say over ten years ago, we had many, many, many RAN vendors. It was a rather competitive market. Um, and um, in some ways, you could say that these vendors were focused on national boundaries. And that wasn't always the case, but it certainly was more the case um, than, it, than it sort of was a couple years ago. 2G era gave way to the 3G and 4G era. This is the one that we, you know, most of us know about where Huawei and ZTE have come in um, to the Western markets and uh, succeeded quite well and caused uh, consolidation in the market, Nokia being one of the major consolidators. Now, um, in the, uh, with OpenRAN um, entering into the marketplace, and what it has allowed operators to do is uh, start the expectation of having unbundled RAN systems. This is what we were talking about earlier. And when you unbundle the RAN systems, you can have multi-vendor networks doesn't mean that a, an operator will choose to employ a multi-vendor network. In other words, you know, baseband from one vendor and radio from another, for instance. But it is increasing the competitive landscape. So now if you look at the right side of this chart, we now have uh, a, a dramatically larger number of RAN vendors that can bid on these uh, large operator projects. Remember, RAN is the biggest part. Now we have many vendors uh, bidding on these projects. So um, good examples are the DISH network um, in the U.S. We had vendors that have not participated in the U.S. participate and win, okay? This is a big deal because what we've seen is that the typical bidders um, and winners of these projects in the U.S. were not selected. It's a big deal and I expect that this will uh, lead to a bit more price competition in the future as well as new uh, choices in the way that these networks are built. So this is changing the competitive landscape as Open RAN uh, enters the lexicon and uh, becomes part of um, request for proposals, let's say. And uh, next is the, you know, the open source movement, which has yet to impact the marketplace. And I wanted to uh, share with you our research. Now we're, we're done talking about the surveys. This is on 650 group. Uh, forecasts for the RAN market. You can see we're expecting the RAN market to grow and then peak in 2021. Best way to explain it is that we're expecting a bit of a surge as um, operators uh, build out their 5G networks and you know get nationwide coverage. And then we expect there to be a slowdown in the market as this acceleration turns into a deceleration. And um, many of the major markets have uh, you know very good coverage. So this is why we've got a peak in 2021. Uh, there's ample evidence that we 
have uh, you know good spending trends into the end of 2020. If you review the operator spending plans in China, North America, it's pretty clear that that's the case in those markets, and we expect European operators to follow uh, next year with a with a bit of a surge. So this is our spending. Um, I wanted to our spending expectation. What I wanted to do is also point out that one of um one of the things we're expecting is that as there are a larger number of vendors participating, we do expect some price competition. And so this is one of the reasons why we're planning for a revenue decrease as well. So let's summarize uh, what we talked about here today. We um, think running the analogy of NFV is uh, uh, similar to what happened before open ran and then open source. We think this is a good analogy. Uh, we're talking about the same telecom market, very similar techniques across a different part of the network. And so uh, this, is, um, this is one of the research techniques I've employed for you know, decades. I've been researching for a while. Finding one thing that looks like another and mapping it out to the future has worked well. Has worked well. And we do think that, that's, um, uh, that, that, will, uh, that will be a good map for us. The other um, thing I just talked about, which is that there are 10 RAND vendors that are now bidding on these projects, these RAND projects. And this is a result of Open RAND um, primarily, as well as um, uh, we also have the expectation that open source will again give a lot more choice in the future. So this is, um, is another big summary point. Um, I, I mentioned this last year and I'll mention it again, the incumbent vendors uh, have, a, have a bit to lose here. And I think they're going to resist these changes. We uh, are hearing the marketing efforts of these uh, very powerful uh, vendors. And um, they do have some very good uh, proprietary systems that are uh, in high demand. Um, good example is spectrum sharing, where you can share a spectrum between 4G and 5G. That is uh, something that is very valuable and is quite proprietary. So um, this is a good example of um, something the incumbent vendors are doing to uh, resist these efforts. Um, we do expect service providers will experience capital savings as a result of uh, employing open uh, systems and open source. And uh, just like to summarize here with um, the idea that uh, in our surveys, at least 100% of service providers are confident that they'll move to open source or have mass adoption of open source in five years this is a big deal. Um, and uh, I'd like to conclude on that note. Thank you. Chris, thanks. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate you, you being with us today. And um, a couple of things came up for me as I was listening to uh, your talk. And uh, maybe you could uh, you know, help answer some questions for me. You so bet. I'm curious if looked at it enough now that you have any kind of um, feel for the revenue that the, the disruptive RAND vendors are starting to achieve. You have any insight into that? Well, yeah. Uh, so we, we track this uh, type of data uh, on a quarterly basis. And um, what we're finding is that the, the quarterly run rate now of the, the, let's just say the open RAND startup vendors that we've got listed in the, in the presentation is now approaching about 100 million a quarter so it's it's becoming measurably uh measurable and and it, it's um it's making an impact all right yeah that's um larger than i would have expected so that's interesting and that's really and um do you know where it was a year ago i mean what's that ramp look like over the last year oh it's a small fraction of that uh last year um uh if I'm, I'm going from memory right now but i uh, i believe in the second quarter last year it was on un under 50 million a quarter Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then I'm curious too, another form of breakdown is, uh, you know, with the new, well, the new ORAN architecture breaks ran into RU, DU, CU, or, or you were describing it as kind of um, RU and, and, and uh, baseband, yeah, or, right. uh, BBU. Uh, what the breakup there looks like, you know, what percentage of the two, what the market split is. Right. So th what's happening now uh, is th these um, splits are for the first time being established because you know, back in the old days when you would buy a RAN system from a vendor who sold you all the parts, there really was not a break up, a breakdown of those uh, on the inlet, on the say, like the on the invoice. So what the approximate split is for these new contracts is about two thirds radio and one third baseband. Um, there aren't many, too many examples to point to, but that's uh, 
that's what we uh, that's what we're seeing across the um, uh, the vendors that are participating in the market now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, and I don't know if you have any insight into the number of ready units per baseband unit or the ratio of RUs to DU, DU to CU, and maybe it's just too too early in the market, but I'd be curious if you're seeing any insight there. Yeah, um, I mean historically it's been kind of a three three to one, um, but we're you know we're seeing. But so first of all, it's kind of hard to count the um, in the case of where it's a virtual RAN system, virtual baseband. You know uh, these are run on multiple computers having a virtualization or container type of layer, so it's really hard to say exactly how many pieces of hardware it is. You know, I, I hate to give you the it depends answer, but it kind of depends. Mm -hmm. But um, the the ratio, um, I think, if you were to uh, connect, you know, radios down to the physical hardware through the virtualization layer, it wouldn't be dramatically far off from what it was previously. Um, you know, these 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 uh, hardware systems do have accelerators, and they're um, they are uh, working faster than if they were non-accelerated servers. But um, I, I think you, you could say they're around the same ratio. Hmm. And um, and so that three to one ratio, I'm curious if, uh, you know, it's common that in a, in a cell tower, you'd have um, three sectors, essentially three radios kind of going out in, in three different directions. Is that also connected to that three to one ratio? I mean, is there a, is that relationship? Yeah, is that's, a, that's kind, kind of what I had in mind at the time in, when I was answering the question about the sectors. So um, what, what, what's happening right now with the open end systems is for the most part, um, we're talking about uh, radio uh, systems that are, that are like 2T, 2R, 4T, 4R type of systems. Uh, next year, there is an expectation that some of the radio vendors that participate in this ecosystem will have uh, higher um, you know, uh, order systems out, you know, the massive MIMO class of products. And that's sort of a, sort of a next year event. Um, we saw Rakuten um, uh, when it went to commercial launch this spring um, show the NEC hardware, which was massive MIMO. If my memory serves me, it was a 32T32R system. Um, and you know that, that uh, the timing of when that would get incorporated into their network was not made clear at that time, but my, my thinking is probably end of this year, uh, beginning of next year is what, mm -hmm. what would be expected and there are other radio um vendors besides uh, nec that are also um making these types of systems available mm -hmm. yeah and i'm seeing sort of classes of uh, companies that we don't um uh, often think of maybe they were buried in the ecosystem or in the supply chain starting to bubble up you know and i think we've seen that in other disaggregated markets right so I think absolutely that, uh, the names I mean, is going to this is what happened with the hyperscaler market. If you, you know, remember, remember the chip companies, uh, Broadcom is a, a very classic example. They were selling to the systems vendors who then sold to the hyperscalers. This is ancient history now, but uh, then the chip companies began selling to the hyperscalers and we, we know the rest. They, they had products made for them uh, by ODMs and kind of cut the branded vendors out of, out of much of the market. Right. Yeah. You know, and of course, the, another part of that was there used to be OEMs in there too. So you had chip... <laughs> ODM right. to OEM, to, you know, to, and um, and that's completely yeah. collapsed. It and, has, uh, right? So uh, you know, we're starting to see that definitely happen, say in the broadband space and some other spaces, and and I guess right. um, we're all anticipating that the same will happen in the RAN, in the RAN space. So, <clears throat> so we talked about that uh, disaggregation and the market split. Are you do you see you? Um, and you know, two thirds, one third. Uh, what about you know, the next disaggregation that's starting to take place is, is vertical disaggregation. And maybe that's where open source really starts to come in as well. And it might be too early uh, to now forecast, or the, you know, uh, no real numbers for that as of yet. But um, I guess I feel compelled to ask anyway. I mean, that, that vertical split where um, uh, either just running software on open hardware or that real, that RIC and the X app split that's starting to come where, you know, some of that intelligence is, is kind of being lifted up um, out of the RAN into, into the cloud. Do you have any visibility into that or what that revenue split ratio might look like or anything in that space? Boy, yeah, Timon, you are right. Um, it is kind of early <laughs> to say. Um, I have to uh, just take, like, taking a stab at it. Um, I think in the next handful of years, it'd be, it'd be kind of a, a, quite, a, quite a small number. Um, you know, the, the thing about uh, these radio networks is uh, the operators, simply can't take risks um, 
like they can with other parts of the network. And um, my my hunch is that it'll it'll be a little while before you see um, uh, live traffic over over these systems. They'll be trialed for a while, but um, mm -hmm. I know I, I do expect I do expect it to have a contribution. I'm just thinking a handful of years out out in the future is is when we'll be talking about those uh, splits. Kind of. So, Sort of similar to what I was saying in the charts. It it would be great and interesting if it was happening, you know, next year. But um, I think that that, that the, if I run the analogy of what happened with NFV, it took a couple of years, you know, of trialing. There were a lot of lot of lab tests that happened, and and um, you know, there there was some open source being used at the time, um, and uh, those those systems ran for about a year or two. Um, but mm -hmm. now they're being used so you know that that's what's so encouraging about it as far as far as i see it you know we've, we've got a good analogy to to uh to run with here All right so um so that's kind of in the timeline and you said something to that effect like in your slides as well that you know the open ran is coming before open source ran and and right um uh, and that all makes a lot of sense. But uh, I also am curious about sort of the revenue split. And again, it's, it's really early to say, but you know, as you start getting that vertical disaggregation, how much of the revenue will be kind of in software and hardware. But um, as you've gone back to a few times today, you know, going back to the NFV market and the NFV journey, yeah. um, maybe there's something to extract from there. So, um, you know, in that, uh, I guess two questions there. It's, it's uh, in that NFV journey, uh, what, uh, what was the total capex savings that kind of resulted after a couple of years in the journey, and uh, and in the uh, sort of in the end result, what did the split look like? You know, software versus hardware, and how that market kind of uh, came to be. What can you say yeah. about that? Well, th there is a lot of value uh, in the software. There's no question about it. And um, what what we've what we've seen is that uh, as the number of competitors rises. Um, you do see some devaluing of the software. If there are more competitors bidding on the project, prices go lower. And uh, that's kind of what we saw uh, in the NFE era where uh, because the physical devices had the software embedded in them, um, once we, we unbundled them, kind of your point of vertical uh, dis disaggregation, um, we saw in some cases uh, like drops of uh, revenues for major vendors in certain geographies dropping like 50% over the course of two quarters. 50% is a big, big change. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's um, too high of an expectation to, to expect for, for a market like the REN, REN market. But um, I, do, I do expect that over time we could, we could see uh, you know, drops of in, in selling prices that um, don't approach 50%, but maybe 10 or 20%. Again, this is um, me just sort of comparing and contrasting one market to the other. Uh, the core market is actually has quite a few differences to the RAN market. The RAN market will always be very hardware dependent because of the devices that go out on towers and, and uh, lampposts. Uh, you, you can't you know, install a server there and have it act like a, an antenna on a radio system. That's just not what's gonna happen. So um, it, it is very different. Uh, in that respect, but on the on the baseband systems, well, that that looks quite a bit more like uh, like the the telecom core market. And they're um, I think s s expecting savings that might even approach fifty percent are not uh, completely unrealistic. But of course, go back to that split between you know radios and baseband, and I think that's uh, that's why we have to adjust expectations uh, between the two markets. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And that split um, vertically, you know, software versus hardware in the NFE space. Do you have some view on that? Like how much, of, yeah. you know, how much of the in software? <laughs> Thanks for uh, checking in on that question again, Simon. <laughs> uh, yeah, what we what we saw in the early days was sort of like a like a 70 30 uh, split where about 70 um, percent uh, was the value for the software and 30 percent for the hardware, something on that order. Um, and, and it has generally, uh, generally held. Um, in the early days, actually, you kind of had, um, in some cases, when you added up uh, the purchasing of physical uh, networking functions as well as the you know, virtual functions plus the additional hardware, actually, the, the total came to over 100% of what was spent before. But then once you have multiple um, elements running on, you know, server systems that are in common, you actually got the benefit. And I think that you'll kind of see the 
sort of a similar trend with RAN. I, I, I'm expecting you'll see dedicated RAN systems um, because they have these acceleration systems that are very unique to RAN. Um, they'll be, you know, they won't be having multiple systems running on them. It'll be kind of, kind of dedicated to baseband uh, initially, but over time you might see, you know, more uh, systems running on, more elements running on them over, over time, and then you get more savings over, over that period mm -hmm. of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Interesting. So, um, and maybe in closing, you know, most of our discussion today has been around um, telco and RAN and the yeah. telco and, and that, uh, but I'm curious about uh, really the enterprise vertical, or even mm -hmm. maybe there's a cloud vertical in here yeah. and, uh, and that intersection of open RAN and, um, and private networks for enterprise and, and edge cloud for enterprise and, and all of that. Um, so uh, I'm wondering what you're thinking about that. Um, uh, number one, you know, what, um, uh, how significant is the enterprise opportunity? I guess you talked about a little bit with your spectrum analysis right. and whatnot. You know, yep. I inferred from that, that you think there's something going on there. Um, and, uh, and then maybe what the cloud players are, are doing in this space uh, is they mm -hmm. also kind of seem to be going after something. Yeah, you bet. Well, so the enterprise market has, you know, primarily been served by Wi-Fi. This is an area that we, we research and publish on quite frequently. Um, Wi-Fi is great at a lot of things. Um, in fact, you could say it's, it's the best at, at, at some things, but it doesn't serve um, all the future needs that, a, that, a, that an enterprise might want. So there is a place for cellular as well as other, other protocols um, in, in enterprise uh, or, or just say at organizations. And um, at this point, it is re relatively more complex to um, build out a cellular network uh, at an enterprise. And there's a, an ecosystem of managed service providers that are uh, building around the idea to serve uh, cellular needs of, of, of organizations. Um, these are not necessarily mobile network operators like we've been talking about, you know, for the most part today. Um, and so this ecosystem of managed service providers plus the, the hardware and software that would allow enterprises to build out these um, enterprise cellular networks. This is an opportunity that we're expecting in the next handful of years to be about a billion dollars. Um, so we're actually quite bullish on it. And um, I have to say that it does, in some ways, encroach on the opportunity of the mobile network operators in that op these mobile operators, um, when they're asked in public, you know, what are their expansion plans for 5G? One of the big opportunities they're talking about is the enterprise network. And um, they're going to meet with some competition from a new breed of startup, which are managed service providers. So... Um, there's there's a, a new you know new battle uh, line being drawn at the enterprise, and I think it's going to be pretty pretty exciting. So uh, I'm sure sure uh, everybody's um, who, who's interested in this market has noticed what Microsoft has done recently. They've acquired two um, two medium sized companies in the telecom market, Affirmed Networks, which is uh, uh, you know an expert in in packet core, uh, uh, and and Metaswitch, who's an expert in the IMS market. And if you consider what these two companies have to offer, um, they've got a, a, a quite a, a good clientele uh, across the telecom market. And um, they're, they're part of now a very large organization, which is one of the most successful uh, hyperscalers on earth. And um, the company hasn't Microsoft has not come right out and said what exactly their plans are. They plan a briefing actually a couple of weeks down the line uh, from today, but uh, they they have stated in their public statements that they they plan to uh, offer uh, a service uh, to service providers and enterprises, which is uh, going to leverage the acquired company's software. So I think that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, this could enable enterprises to go out and build their own networks and you know run it on the cloud just like they do uh their crm or erp systems and imagine that you know you just kind of point and click your way through and you got your network running um so uh just to conclude on that point what we are seeing right now on the um azure the microsoft uh marketplace as well as well as the amazon web services marketplace you can go and uh click a few buttons and have uh those 
two companies uh, send out um, managed service providers to go out and build a CBRS network for you. We're in the really early stages, but you know, imagine that you click on a button, someone comes out and installs a wireless network for you, and then you can provision it with IMS and packet core in the background, um, run off the cloud. It, it would be um, kind of similar to the way the Wi-Fi market has evolved since 2010 when Meraki introduced cloud managed Wi-Fi. So there's, um, there, are, uh, there are quite a, quite a few opportunities in the cellular market and enterprise, and um, we're just gonna have uh, new, new ways to deliver this, this technology. Yeah, uh -huh. no, it makes a lot of sense. And it's a very exciting time in this market. And, and this is a whole you know, additional facet that uh, we hadn't gotten into um, before this. So, um, and I think that maybe I was remiss, maybe, you know, one question I didn't ask but that I would love to ask is, um, you know, are you yet sizing the open RAN market, you know, and kind of carving that off separately? Um, yeah, we are. This is, uh, this is an area that um, is part of our RAN research. And, um, you know, we are, we are um, looking at it as uh, sort of a, a fraction or an overlay uh, type of research area, um, you know, on top of our RAN market, because it, it's, just really a different kind of RAN. And it's not like you can go call 4G or 5G, but yes, yes, we have research there and um, we are quite bullish on it. And I have to say, now that we've uh, seen these um, survey results, I've become a little bit more bullish. So we're, we're gonna tweak our estimates probably in part as a result of this, um, this work that we've done uh, here that we presented today. And um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's an important area, and like I said, it, it, it dovetails into some of our thinking about the total RAN market with respect to pricing and, and uh, you know, vendor participation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And any numbers you can share? Well, we're expecting this can approach uh, something between 10 to 20 percent of the, of the market in, in a handful of years of time. And so if you were to take a look at our, you know, our 4G plus 5G charts and kind of multiply by 10 to 20 percent uh, over the forecast, that's, that's the range where where we're where we're at i have to say i'm um, part of the difficulty in coming up with an open ran number is just sticking to a definition of it and you know uh, i'm aware that others are uh making their own pr prognostications and and um it, it is gonna you're gonna see uh, estimates for this market um range uh you know from small to big depending on what definitions are are used here so um, I think that's that's uh, something really important to consider when you know when in the future you'll see more more estimates out there. So that that's uh, that's um that's kind of just like a caveat that I want to share with you yeah. at this point. No, no, that makes sense. In any new market, you've got that kind of uh, jostling as things settle yeah. down and people kind of uh, settle on agree on definitions and whatnot. Well, Chris, I want to thank you very much today. I really appreciate you being here. Um, you know, I, I think some terrific insight and really nice to see these updates with, you know, really looking at Open RAN with a little more depth this year. So um, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Tom, and appreciate the uh, opportunity. Thank you.